So John 20, verses 24 to 31, all the words will be on the screen. And I'll read them to you now. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my God. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Evidence is not usually a word you associate with religion or faith or Christianity. Evidence, proof. In fact, a lot of people think that faith is the very opposite of evidence and reason and anything that makes sense in the real world. But that is entirely wrong. Evidence is a word you should associate with Christian faith. Amongst all the religions of the world, I would submit that it really is the only one with good, hard evidence for the truth of it. Christianity is not blind faith. It is not a leap into the dark. It is not merely a feeling or a sentiment. It is not based on stories or traditions but on an event in history, something you can investigate, something you can examine, something you can look into. Evidence, proof. As a family, we've enjoyed watching Death in Paradise. And uh, often someone will say, as they're being quizzed in that final scene, Well, that's all very interesting, detective, but can you prove a single word of it? And usually the detective will reply, well, yes, actually I can. And he'll present the evidence. And that's what John is doing here. He is presenting the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He's presenting, he's proving it. And it's solid. All the evidence they could ever want. So we'll consider the evidence they had, the evidence we have, that Jesus rose from the dead and that he is the Messiah and the Son of God. And then we'll look at, in that last verse, what effect it has on us. What is the result of believing in Jesus? as the Messiah and the Son of God, on the basis of that evidence. The evidence they had, first of all then, in in verses 24 to 28. Jesus gave Thomas, in that moment, Jesus gave Thomas all the evidence. And he gave them all, actually, then and the week before, all the evidence they could possibly need to know that he was alive again. Hard evidence. What more could Jesus have done to prove to them that he was alive again than to show himself in this way and to offer 
for them to touch and see the reality of his resurrection body. What more could Jesus have done to prove that this was real? Isn't it crystal clear, as John in this Gospel reports it for us, that these weren't gullible guys who would believe in anything. But like Thomas, they were all, they'd all been doubters. They'd all been skeptics. None of them were expecting to see Jesus alive again. It was the last thing on their minds. And they took a lot of convincing. And they were convinced by hard evidence. And isn't it also being made very clear to us that Jesus was no hallucination, no dream, no kind of imagination of theirs. And he wasn't a ghost. He was not a ghost or a spirit because here he is among them, telling them to see and to touch. The evidence, the proof for them was undeniable. They could not deny that Jesus was alive again. The one who had been brutally crucified just days before. And uh, there are many guys who've who've worked hard on this and looked into this long and hard. Uh, One uh, academic, really, called Gary Habermas from the United States has done a lot of work, spent hours and hours looking into the resurrection. Uh, And I like what he says about this. He says that... uh, 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 there's a virtual consensus amongst, amongst scholars. That is to say, there's a, almost every academic agrees, those who spent time looking at these things. And looking into Jesus' resurrection, that after Jesus' death, his disciples really believed. They were really convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead. That's undeniable. Even those Folks, those academics who don't, are not Christians, not really believers in Jesus, they do recognize that the disciples really believed. They were really convinced that they saw something that made them really sure that Jesus was alive again. And they claimed that the risen Jesus had appeared to them in no uncertain terms, as you can see here and in the other Gospels. Not only did did they make that claim that he was alive again, but they were changed. There was a change that came over over them. And what is it that accounts for that change? They had been, as you can see, locked away in this room, um, fearful, cowering individuals, fearful of being found out and arrested. They had denied Jesus, they had abandoned him. They deserted him, hadn't they? They'd all deserted him when he was arrested. And they became bold proclaimers of the good news of the risen Jesus. How did that happen? Where did that come from? How is that to be explained? They were changed. Something happened to them. And they would claim it's because they really did see and meet the risen Jesus. And they were sure. And the third thing, maybe it's the most powerful thing of all, they were consistent. They claimed they were changed, and they were consistent in what they said to the very end of their lives, the very end of their days. Habermas says they remained steadfast in the face of imprisonment, torture, and even martyrdom. They were killed for this. They were killed for this faith because they believed that Jesus had risen again, and they preached it. Now that's a huge thing, isn't it? To continue to hold on to something. If if you weren't sure, or if you'd made it up, you would never, under that kind of pressure of imprisonment, or death itself, you would never hold on to something. If that was going to get you into that kind of trouble. Their belief in resurrection was unbreakable because they were sure they'd really seen him and met him. And he'd 100% proved to them that he had come back to life. What more could he have done for these disciples to prove his reality? 
Notice how, one thing I only noticed yesterday, how he stood among them, both in nine, verse 19 and 26 of John 20. We're told that he stood among them when he, when he appeared amongst them, with them. He wasn't just in front of them at some distance in a haze. He stood among them. They could see. He was right up close and they could see him from all sides. It was real. And he invited them, didn't he? Both uh, before, the week before and now with Thomas, to touch and, and the holes in the, the hands and the side and the, the feet. And then later in, in the next chapter, we see that he's eating cooked fish with them on the beach. How, how real is that? And so we're told in the Bible, aren't we, that over 40 days after his, his death and resurrection, in different places, to different groups, to ones and twos, to, to big groups, even to 500 at one time, he proved that he was alive again, again and again. And they were so sure. They were all willing to suffer for it. And 10 out of the 11 of them died for it. And the other one was, was sent off to, to a, a prison island like Alcatraz and left to rot. They were all willing to be persecuted for it. You'll see a hint of that in the next chapter, uh, verses 18 and 19, if, if you're looking in, into the Bible. You see, no one dies for something they know to be a lie. No one dies for something they know they just made up. But they never caved in. They never gave way. They never kind of got to the point under pressure where they said, okay, okay, I admit it. It didn't really happen. We just made it up. But they never said that. And why would they lie? Another uh, guy who's looked into the resurrection a lot, a guy called Peter Kreeft, I like what he says about this. He says, why would they lie? Liars always lie. Oh, there's somebody at the back there. Sorry. Sorry, let me go, go back to that. Why would they lie? Why would the apostles lie? Why would John lie? Liars always lie for selfish reasons. If they lied, what was their motive? What did they get out of it? What did they get out of lying if they were lying? Well, what they got out of it was misunderstanding, rejection, persecution, torture, and martyrdom. That's to say they died for it. He says, hardly a list of perks. You don't die for something you know to be a lie. You don't die for something that gets you into a heap of trouble. And that's what happened. It's only if you're absolutely convinced that these things are true that you hold to them to the very end. And that's exactly what they did. So that was the evidence that they had. It was hard, solid evidence. But of course, that's not exactly the same evidence that we have, right? We don't get to see Jesus in the flesh. They did, but we don't. They had to. It was important. But we don't get that same kind of evidence exactly. The evidence that we get is spelt out in verses 29 and 30. And it's still very, very good evidence. You see, I don't think Jesus is telling Thomas off in verse 29 when he says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I don't think he's telling Thomas that his faith is not as good as the faith of those who have not seen. I think he's simply spelling out the difference between the faith of the first generation of believers, like Thomas, like John, like Peter, which had to be based on actually seeing Jesus, and all later generations, which has a different basis. They had to see with their eyes, and Jesus made sure they did, and they were sure of it. But now our faith can rest on their eyewitness accounts, their eyewitness testimony or witness. And of course, you need those eyewitnesses in the first place. In, in any court of law, in any court case, there have to be first-hand witnesses, ideally, of, uh, to provide solid evidence, and we have that. But not everybody needs to be in the position, in that position. 
You need someone who has been there, who says, yes, I was there, I saw it, I saw him, I heard him, I can testify this is true, and John is very, very clear about this. If you back up to chapter 19, verse 35, he says of himself, really, the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony, his witness, his report is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe, which is like verse 31 in our chapter. So for us, you see, it's not the evidence of our eyes. We don't get to see the risen Jesus. He, he hasn't hung around for 2,000 years. He had to return to his Father in order to send the Spirit to be with all his people everywhere, to be with us and to be in us. His Spirit is with us, but we don't see Him now in the flesh. We look forward to the day when we will see Him again, but seeing is not for now. Now we have the writings. Now we have the evidence of their witness, their testimony. Isn't that what's being said to us in verses 29 uh, and 30 in particular? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But it's not because they've taken a leap into the dark without any foundation or basis at all, just a crazy, oh yeah, I'm going to believe. But because they've believed the evidence that has been presented in the Gospels like this one. Verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs. Signs meaning miracles. Wonderful things that he did and topped off by his own resurrection. And these are recorded for us, aren't they? They're written down, they're recorded for us here that we might believe, verse 31. That's the basis of our faith. That's the evidence that we have. And it's a great basis. It's a strong basis because we can be convinced that they were convinced and that they were not deceiving men. They weren't people who were having us on. They weren't people who were making this all up. You can look into that. And they weren't people who were deluded, who were just crazy out of their minds. Look into it and you'll see that that's the case. It makes perfect sense to believe what they believed. So that many times this kind of evidence has been examined by lawyers, by detectives, by journalists, even those who were opposed to Jesus. And they found it again and again as they've examined the evidence of the tomb being empty and the appearances to, to the disciples and the changes in them and the fact that they were ready to die for what they believed, that these guys have found they have become completely convinced that the only thing that makes any sense at all is that Jesus actually rose again from the dead and if I can speak personally for a moment, I think around the age of 20 or so, there was a time in my life when I, I took time with this. I took time to consider the evidence for the resurrection. And I became convinced that it is true, that it must be true, that no other explanation makes sense of what we know, what happened, how did the church suddenly burst into life across the known world? How did that all happen, given the state these guys were in after the crucifixion. You see, I'm not a Christian simply because my parents were Christians. They were, and I'm very grateful, but that's not why I'm a Christian. I had to make up my own mind when I was around 18, 19, 20. I am a Christian because I believe it's true. I am convinced it is true. And I think you can be too if you look into it. Well, finally, what was the result of, or what is the result for all readers now, including us, of believing in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God? Well, you see it there in verse 31, don't you? These are written, these things that Jesus did, these signs that point to who he is. The Messiah, the Son of God, these signs, these miracles are written down, why? In order that you may believe. They're the evidence for your faith. And that by believing, 
you may have life in his name. John calls all readers, including us, to believe. He calls us to a reasonable belief on the basis of the evidence that he presents to us in his book, his little book, we call the Gospel of John. And now reading the evidence of the miracles, these what he calls signs, the miraculous signs. We follow that evidence to believe in Jesus. We don't take a leap into the dark, but we follow the evidence that is presented for us in John, in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and even in the Old Testament prophecies and all the ways that Jesus fulfilled them, we follow the evidence to find that it's true. He is the one. He is the Messiah. But believing is not a great word in English, is it? It's not a very strong word. It does not really capture what John is trying to say. Because he's talking about more than simply believing something about Jesus. You know, you can say, I believe in... I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And it doesn't do much for you. It doesn't do much to you. It doesn't make much difference to your life. Well, this, this word really, believing, is more powerful than that and much more personal than that. And like I said on Friday, with that illustration, it's more like resting your whole weight on Jesus and committing yourself to Him and entrusting your life to Him. And a, a phrase I particularly like, embracing Jesus, something we are not allowed to do at the moment, are we? But unless you're, you're bubbled with that, that person, but we look forward to the day when we can actually hug each other again. But you can embrace Jesus by faith as your Lord and Savior. That's what believing here means. Trusting, entrusting, committing, embracing Him. But that's not the end of it, is, is it? It's, the purpose is not really... It's not merely that we might believe, but he goes on to say that by believing, something happens. There's a result, there's an, an outcome, there's an effect. And it's a beautiful one. What is the result of following the evidence that John presents and believing in Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God? What is it? It's life. Life is the result. Life in his name, right there at the end. Life through Him, through His death and resurrection. Now, we've been calling this, haven't we, in our little flyers, a matter of life and death. Life through Jesus. What kind of life are we talking about, though? Well, obviously not just physical life, because we have that already. Uh, you're, you're, all, you're all alive here, I think. I might have put some of you to sleep, but you're alive as far as I can see. We have physical life already, don't we? So he's talking about something else, something beyond, something greater and bigger than just surviving. A lot of us have felt like during the pandemic, the lockdown, we've barely survived at times. But he's talking about something more, isn't he? Spiritual life. Well, he calls it different things in this gospel. Chapter 3, verse 16, the great John 3, 16, what does he call it? He calls it eternal life or everlasting life. In chapter 6, verse 63, he calls it spiritual life. In chapter 10, verse 10, wonderfully he calls it abundant life or life to the full. And then in chapter 11, verse 25, before he raises Lazarus, what does he call it? Well, if you've been to a funeral recently, you may have heard the words. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. It is resurrection life. It's wonderful to look at all the different ways the, the, the Gospel of John speaks of this life. Paul, if I may just add for your interest, Paul calls it sometimes new life. Romans 6 verse 4, this life is new life. Or he speaks about reigning in life. Romans 5 verse 17, or being alive to God. Romans 6 verse 11. As we sung earlier, being more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's a life, isn't it? What a life that is, to be more than conquerors through him who loved us. And perhaps one of my favorites in 1 Timothy 6.19, Paul calls it life that is truly life. Truly life. Life that is really living. Really being alive. Not just surviving. Not just getting by, but truly being alive. But most often it is called eternal life. 
And we get that 17 times in John's Gospel alone. When you come to believe in Jesus, you receive eternal life. You see, believing in Jesus and his resurrection is not like studying history at school. It's not just a history lesson lesson we're giving you. There is evidence to consider, but this is not a history lesson. I guess that when you studied history at school, as much as you might have enjoyed it, it was not, shall we say, exactly life-changing. Maybe it was, I don't know. Maybe you had a great history teacher. But this history is life-changing. It's life-giving. It's eternal life-giving. When you believe it, when you take hold of it, when you embrace it by faith, it is life in His name, eternal life. It breathes a new life into you, a new kind of life, a new quality of life. A life that lasts forever, but also a life that is the very best. Life to the full. And then ultimately, We have, don't we, as Christians, that wonderful hope of resurrection life, being raised to everlasting joy, happiness, and glory forever. And I think you can just see the the quality of this new life here and some of the other words that Jesus uses. Look at verse 26 and 21 and 19. I don't know if you're on those pages, but I can flag up at least 26 for you here. What is it that Jesus says to them? Those who have deserted him and denied him, peace be with you. Peace, shalom, well-being, peace be with you. You'll find it three times in John 20. And verse 20, joy, they were overjoyed when they saw him. That's the kind of life we're promised as we trust in Jesus, a life of peace and joy. Life to the full. So this is something that changes people and breathes new life into them. New eternal spiritual life. And whatever the critics may say, the Christ of the New Testament, the Jesus of the Bible, can change lives. Millions of people from all backgrounds, all nationalities all races and all professions, spanning more than 20 centuries now, are witnesses to the the sin-breaking power of God's salvation. Take, for example, a man who had been an alcoholic. Uh, In a book... um, I'm sorry, but I can't... I'll just be speaking to Cortana there, weirdly, but uh, how how that ever came up, there you go. (laughs) Let me try again. Uh, A man who had been an alcoholic. This is from a book called Evidence for the Resurrection by Josh McDowell. He says, take for example a man who had been an alcoholic with a vivid memory of past hopeless struggles and a new sense of power through Christ. And he was challenged that his religion, that his faith in Christ was a delusion. We've heard that before, haven't we? That it's a delusion to believe in Jesus. That you're just kind of uh, whistling in the dark, basically. Hoping against hope. Here's what he said. Well then, he said, thank God for the delusion. It has put clothes on my children and shoes on their feet and bread in their mouths. It has made a man of me and has put joy and peace in my home, which had been hell. If this is a delusion, may God send it to the slaves of drink everywhere, for their slavery is an awful reality. The good news is, of course, brothers and sisters, that this is no delusion. The evidence is solid. This is a powerful, life-changing, life-giving truth. Jesus is alive. Believe it, and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the very solid ground beneath our feet for the very solid evidence that you gave to Thomas and the other disciples that you are truly alive again. And that everything that you have done for us through your life and death is now confirmed and uh, given a great big yes and amen because you have been raised from the dead 
And all of those good things are guaranteed to us by God. We thank you. We look to you. We pray that you'll give us grace to embrace Jesus by faith in that personal and powerful moment of commitment and that those of us who have already come to believe in Him, Father, may go from strength to strength, becoming more and more sure, more and more confident about Jesus and His resurrection. And so filled with that quality of life, that joy and peace that is promised to those who trust in Him. We ask it in His name. Amen.